I think most LGBTQ people have at some point in their life felt that deep fear of rejection because of their sexuality or their gender identity. And I know I definitely had it. That fear of rejection is real because there is an insane statistic that says one in four young homeless people in the UK is LGBTQ+. So why are so many young people in the community homeless and what is life really like for them? I'm surprised that it's that high, really. That's a sad figure if it's one in four, but it doesn't, it doesn't shock me. It's very shocking. I literally didn't know that at all. One in four, that's so, that's, that's really big. That's really high, yeah. One of my friends, they finally kicked them out when they were 16, so they were just on the street for two years until they got their life back together. I grew up in Ireland, which is a beautiful setting, but it wasn't a setting for me. It's... Oh, I can't reach that north. Fuck off. I've been in Kerala like, pretty much all my life. And because my mum and dad were alcoholics, I met my husband in Coventry, and he died 2010. Kind of went tits up then, really. I've been rough sleeping for about eight years. But I'm still alive and I'm still breathing. So thank God for some more mercies, eh? A lot of LGBT people, they come to big cities to feel like they have a community or just like-minded people around them. But the problem is, if something goes wrong, they can very, very soon find themselves sleeping rough. So I've come to a very cold, very chilly Birmingham to meet Damien. He's been sleeping rough for many, many years. I'm gonna find out a little bit about his story. Can you tell me the reason why you don't want us to show your face on camera? Um, because I'm afraid of being kicked in the face as soon as somebody sees this on the BBC Three. Because this is a gay homeless documentary. They'll target you because you're gay. Yeah. And that, that is a fear that I live with constantly. Every night I go to sleep, I fear this. I've had my sleeping bag set fire to on the end, only for I was actually slightly awake. I, would, I wouldn't be standing there doing this interview now. I sleep with one eye open, one eye closed. So you're not even getting to sleep, really. If I had a choice, I'd be straight. Because it's easier on my life. I've been called a faggot and a queer ball. You know, I live with that all my life, so. Do you not think it's sad that you've been desensitized to being called such awful names? Not really. Effect? If I wasn't gay, I'd be called a fucking tramp, so. No matter what you are, someone will always pick something to pick about. I've been disowned. I've been speaking to any of my family in 17 years, 16 years. The day you said you were gay was the last day you spoke to them? Yeah. Does mommy and daddy accept you? No. Yeah. yeah. Not straight away. No. Mom. No, my dad, my dad found it very, very difficult. My dad is from Iraq, and you know, it's not really a good thing to be gay no, if you're no, from there, is no, it? No, obviously. He, um... And then you have the Irish mixed in with Iraq. Oh, fuck. Right, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Iraq, Irish Ireland. Catholic. Yeah. <gasps> Hold up. I, uh, I honestly, before I came out, I thought I was gonna end up on the streets like you. I'm only as lucky as I am because they brought me up and they looked after me and they embraced me and they nurtured yeah. me. You didn't, love you didn't have that. I didn't have that. But no point in crying over spit milk is there. Do you know what? I could be lying there in a puddle and I'd still make people laugh. 
Because what's the point in being miserable? Where's it going to get you? We're all little children, all little babies of somebody, and I think we all deserve to have someone who makes us feel safe and loved and worthy. You need to be able to feel like you belong somewhere. You need to have somewhere, regardless of where it is, where you feel safe and you can be truly who you are. Of course, at its worst, homelessness means rough sleeping, but that is just the tip of the iceberg because there are so many people that just go unseen, who are sofa surfing, they're in hostels, or in and out of insecure accommodation. Now, the Albert Kennedy Trust is a charity that specializes in LGBT homelessness. I'm going to meet key worker, Helen, who's hopefully gonna shed some light on just why so many young LGBTs find themselves without a home. The AKT is Britain's only dedicated LGBTQ homeless charity. Hi, yeah. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. How you doing? Come in. We're working with young people that are sort of between the ages of, sort of 23 to 25, and that's a real difficult time. You know, we're talking about young people who have just been suddenly kicked out of house. It's just heartbreaking stuff. People having to sleep in tents, you know. People walking every night because they don't feel safe falling asleep on the bus. People they thought were friends are pushing them into having sex and kind of in a roundabout way saying, you know, yeah, but... You can sleep on my sofa if you have sex. And then obviously drugs, because for every group, it's an escape. You know, people always frown down at people giving homeless people alcohol. They kind of need it. They kind of need it. So it, it's just a difficult balancing act. What kind of LGBTs are coming to you looking for help? Every walk of life, really. Um, every race, every religion or major religion. Homophobia, prejudice, anything like that, it doesn't really matter where you come from. It will exist there in some, some form. Is it parental rejection mm. that is the main reason these kids end up out of a home? Or are there other things at play here? Yeah, parents do play a role in it. And yes, one parent, sometimes two parents, just being very homophobic and quite angry and horrible to their own child. The needs of LGBTQ homeless people, are they different from those of straight homeless people? Sexual health is a big thing, but there isn't much support for that. The issues are different, and the sex is different. So, yeah, there are a lot of stuff that are specific for our young LGBTQ young people. Um, we've got to give them skills to manage rejection. When they first come to Purple Door, we do about two weeks, we'll be like, yeah, let your hair down, relax, you know, get some sleep, don't do things, you know, right on, right on, get your strength back, recoup, because once we start again, there's going to be no stopping. They've kind of got to stay focused, so that's kind of how we prepare them, I suppose. Gay boy, back in school, if you asked me that at 16, if you called me that at 16, I would have acted completely different now. Faggot. Weirdly by one of my friends who would then laugh and be like, oh yeah, but you know I'm joking. And it's like, but it's not, it's not funny. It's not one of those words you can just use. Tranny, it can be taken in two different concepts. So you've got to kind of like identify which is positive and which is negative, if that makes sense. Batty man. I don't really care anymore. He is what he is. I am what I am. If you don't like it, just take it or leave it. Batty boy. Chitty man. It's the embarrassment when it's just shouted out in public when you're just out of nowhere. You could just be going to the shop and just to hear that, it just, it takes you, it's like... <sighs> the gay scene here wears cold though. What gay scene? I'm an openly gay man. But just recently I've kind of came across the terminology of gender neutral. You know, sometimes I feel male or sometimes I feel female. Or there's other days where I, I don't feel male nor female, I just feel me. Plain old me. <laughs> my mum couldn't look after me. So I was taken off my biological family and put into 
the care system. I've never felt part of a community. I've always felt like an outsider. It's made me feel more isolated, more depressed, which then has led for me to be homeless. I went to meet John in his old hometown of Blackburn. This is the last place that I called home prior to being homeless. Do you think it was specifically homophobia that made you homeless? Yeah, because um, for the four and a half years that I stayed here, I was uh, I got nothing but subjected to homophobia. You know, um, every day, even going down to the local shops, it was the dogs abuse I would get, you know, I would wear my wigs or something and they would pull them off. I mean, I've been called like a paedophile and stuff um, just for being gay. They've egged my windows, they've, um, what is it, graffitied the, the property, they've chucked stones at windows, they've, they've broke windows before, um, and the firework through my door. Just the firework? Ask, yeah, firework, yeah. Is there a standout memory of, of one day when they came down and you could see them outside? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I was sitting there watching my telly, quite the thing, um, and all I hear was a thud at my, my window. Next thing I know, a, a big brick, a massive brick, had went through it. And they were all standing outside like, the, the gate, um, shouting and swearing, and the, you know they were chucking rubbish and that in my garden. What were they shouting? Like, faggot, you're a poof. It got to the point where I was in that house, so I would refuse to leave unless if I had to, to go somewhere. But um, I would come back as soon as I could. How much can a person take? Like, at what point did you go, no, I've after had enough? The, after the four and a half year mark, I just I had a complete and utter meltdown. How does it feel to be standing here? I don't know, quite emotional, I think. Um, but you know what? I don't miss it. I don't. You know, I miss maybe some of the memories I had in it, but they're memories. You know, they're they're there. So no, you don't. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um... Okay, so no, it's the Blackburn mentality. Is this, is this what it's like here? Yeah, the Blackburn okay. mentality. <laughs> so there's a man over there. Screaming and shouting at us because we're filming. Do you know who that was? No, but I reckon it would have been the new tenant, probably. What did he um, say to you? If you mind me saying. No, 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 no. no, no said, uh, please, so filming please with the only gay in the village. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I said yeah. it was for me and she with yeah. John. Yeah. And he said something about that faggot bastard. Yeah. Are you okay? After, yeah, yeah, no, no. I do. You're here with like, us. Yeah, 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 no. The gay team. Yeah. <laughs> and you're no longer the only gay in the village. Exactly. There's four of us. <laughs> um, it's shocking. I've never experienced that. I'm, you, but you're like, yeah, whatever, because you're used to it. Yeah, it's um, what I have to put up with on a daily basis. So it's pretty I'm, much the norm. If you've not got a loving environment to be supported in, then you're not going to be able to support and love the person that you, you are. You don't come out once. Like, each time you go somewhere else, you have to come out again. So you go to work, you go to school, you go and meet new people, and you have to come out each and every single time. So it's nice to have at home that stable place where you don't have to come out. You can just, they know, you know, you, they will know what's happening, and you're just comfortable with each other. I've been homeless for six months. I identify as bisexual, but I don't really feel like I want to put a label onto it. I was homeless because of a breakdown in relationship within my family due to hardship and because of my sexuality. I feel like homelessness changes people's identification. You don't feel yourself anymore. You lose what you were. The impact homelessness has had on my life ranges. Confidence, separation from society, not having support, loss of friends and stuff. Being homeless and part of the LGBTQ plus community seems more difficult than other people I've met because 
It's not just one story, it's like telling two stories. Christina has been living in a youth hostel for the past six months. Oh, this is lovely, Christina. Ah, oh, thank you. Do you mind if I have a little poke around and have a little That's look? That's fine, yeah. Is this a Lana Del Rey-esque headpiece? I made it for prom. Can you try it on for me? What was the first time that you noticed that there might be something there? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was about six. I was obsessed with Kylie Minogue. I thought everyone thought she was really adorable and just, she was in this, I think a silver costume and she looked brilliant. I can't get you out of my head video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought like, why am I so obsessed with this woman? She's so, she's just beautiful. Does Kylie still do it for you now? Oh yeah. Yeah, is she your number one? Much, yeah, <laughs> Danny's lovely as well. Oh yeah, if you had a choice though, Danny or Kylie? Kylie. Every time. Oh yeah. <laughs> How did you end up in a place like this? <sighs> my mum didn't really treat me the same as my siblings. And I got to a point where I thought I can't take it anymore. I wasn't allowed to use the bath, the washing machine, the cooker, the fridge, use any of the facilities in the kitchen. Every time I would get food out the freezer or something, she'd accuse me of stealing. I wasn't really allowed to go out. If I came back and she wasn't in a good mood, she wouldn't let me back in. I just had no control. It sounds almost like you were a prisoner mm -hmm. in your own home. Yeah, it was like that. I didn't know what to do with myself. What is your family if they're not going to support you in that, in that situation? It just doesn't make sense to me why they wouldn't want to love you because of because of that, it just, it's just silly. I just couldn't take any more. I said to my teacher, I don't know what to do. I'm already feeling suicidal. I already feel like I don't want to be here and that I, I just, I can't do it anymore. She said, Christina, we can't have it. And called social services and that was it. My status was temporarily homeless for three months after that. Shocking. Yeah. Is this your girlfriend? Mm-hmm, yeah. Oh. I'm loving the blue hair. <laughs> it's been all sorts of colours. Being young and LGBT, that this situation has affected you in the long term? Definitely. Even at college, um, I say my partner. I don't talk openly about having a girlfriend. We never kiss in public. And it really upsets me. It's not okay to be around certain people, people are offended, people don't want to see you do that. I mean, Amy used to get like bricks and stuff thrown off her on her way home and I got pushed down a flight of stairs and my face smacked off a wall. And I, I just had glasses as well, so I literally just got them and the Nelly like went in my eyes and stuff, it was horrible. I can't believe the stuff that you've been through. Mm -hmm. I can't really accept it either. Do you think you ever will? Probably not, no. You've had a roof over your head the whole time, yeah? Yeah. Not one night. I'm lucky. On, on the street. Thank God. <laughs> I know. I feel I would be so vulnerable as well, especially. I don't think you'd, I don't think you'd no. survive. You're too gentle. I think you need to be in a safe place like this. Christina's girlfriend, Amy, has supported her through her homelessness. What it would be like if I didn't have, like, the support. Have you seen a change in Christina? over time? Oh, definitely. I mean, we've been together for nearly three years now and it's just amazing. I think we're both growing a lot as people, but like the changes you've made in your own life and actively like trying to make your situation better, it's phenomenal, really. <laughs> Wouldn't have coped at all, at all. Like, through school, through my dad and just everything at home. Like, you're my rock, pretty much. <laughs> Sounds really sappy, but... <laughs> I wanted the chance to speak to Amy's parents about their support for both of the girls. The first time that you got the pleasure of meeting Christina, I thought they were just mates initially. Yeah, but Amy's quite, um, you know, she keeps a, a lot to herself anyway, so I've always kind of discovered things about Amy rather than, you know, we're having the good old chat about sure. how things going. And you as the dad, what, what was your honest initial reaction? When she said, 
I've actually got a girlfriend. All I said was, thank God I haven't got to worry about you getting pregnant. That was me. <laughs> My mum said the same thing. <laughs> well, you're both unbelievably open and, and accepting. I mean, do, do you as parents realise just how special that kind of love is and that not everyone has that? If, if you thought about all the elements that made a person a person, sexuality is really, it's like, you know, it's only one segment, isn't it? That is just one thing. So why do people pick that one thing out and make it that that's what the whole person is about? So you two being such open and accepting parents, what did it feel like then when, when you saw Christina's situation? Amy had said, well, can't you stay here for a while? This is absolutely not a problem. But what I didn't want was I only having the options of being here. So I'd said it probably in the long term to find out how you could yeah. live independently. People think their own ideology is so strong that they can't accept anything that's on the outskirts of that. And I can't understand why people can't be more accepting. At some stage, perhaps as they get older, they miss their child, they will regret it. At some stage of all. Definitely, yeah. It's a uh, hashtag I saw your dad on Grindr. When I get picked on, it's a thing that I either say in my head or to them personally. It takes my mind off the hurt and the, the pain that they're causing. Oh, excuse me, that's my phone, I'll Sorry. be the council. Mm. Hello. So is this a um, attempt tenancy or all right, okay, right, no, that's okay then. And um, what about my belongings? Thanks, bye, bye. God. Well, there you go, a bit of good news. Um, I've got my attempt tenancy tomorrow, so. I'm excited, nervous, because um, I just don't know what I'm going into. Like, through the, this situation, I've kind of lost my independence a bit. I'm just uh, packing some of my stuff. Yeah, just trying to get it all organised. This is just a, like a stepping stone. Um, I'm getting somewhere in the line of homelessness. Oh, you've never seen any there. Look at that. You smell. smell of cannabis. <laughs> so, this is 13. So, I'll leave you. You can have a wee wonder. Yeah. So, this is your sitting room. All yeah. Over. Kitchen. Yeah, man. Fridge. Easy thing to cook yeah. up. Hey. Pots and pans and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well. yeah. And at the back is your bathroom. This is your bedroom. That's it. It's just empty. It is very empty, but uh, I'm sure you'll not be long <laughs> Probably not. Oh, you want to go and have a wee sit down? <laughs> take it all in? Despite having new house keys in his hands, things for John are not so simple. I'll be alright. I usually am. I feel a bit lost in it, to be honest. Something I don't know. Don't even think I'm quite comfortable with the idea, to be honest. It's just, I don't know the area. I just, I don't know nobody. I just feel like I'm just going to become more isolated, you know. What's your first memory of when you realised you fancied Phyllis? Do you remember Casper the Friendly Ghost? The movie? Yeah. Do you remember when Casper turned into that boy? This is so funny, I had the exact same crush. <laughs> All the girls in school were saying, oh my God, he's gorgeous. And I was like, oh my God, he is gorgeous, this ghost. <laughs> I must have been about 
12, 13 or something like that. And I think that was my first I thought. Oh love. Absolutely freezing tonight. I mean like I'm wearing these and the tips of my fingers are they feel like they're gonna fall off. And he's got like two tiny layers on. I can't to be honest with you, I feel a bit stupid wearing all of this in front of him. He's taking me around the local area, showing me where he hides all of his stuff, all of the sleeping bags, the quilts and all of that, and then the different spots in, in the town where he can sleep. He says there's about a hundred of them, but he's gonna show me the one where he uses them, um, where he lays his head most often. This, is this gonna be where you'll sleep tonight? Yeah, yeah. Right here? Yeah. Need a second can now. H how many cans in a day? Ten. Ten cans? Mm. He's uh, just gone in to get a can because he started to get shaky. It's been, I think, an, an hour since he's had one. And I guess he, he just needs it to feel normal, which is understandable, I guess. It's a bit sad, but we're going to let him do his thing and then, then we're going to carry on. You feeling better that you got it? I don't know. It just keeps me warm, really. Do you know what I mean? Oh, that's a brothel. That's a brothel? Yeah. Have you frequented it? I'm like, shite. <laughs> they don't do willies in I there. I don't believe, oh, they don't do willies? They don't do willies. Uh, Dirty <laughs> bastards. <laughs> I'll go and show you now where, um, where we hide our stuff. Look, sleeping bag in the quilt. Yeah. Now we have another sleeping bag under there. We put this one over um, to keep the rest of them dry. Is, it, is there a risk, though, that another homeless person or a group of homeless people will come in? Yeah, there's always that risk, but it's a risk you're willing to take, really. It's where else are you going to put it? Exactly. What's this place that we're going to now? We're going to go to the yard place where I used to sleep. Are they railway arches? Yeah. Wow. What a place. Are you warm enough? Yeah. Yeah? It's well warm. There's a nice little coach in all the fecker. Keep yourself warm, night and God bless you, son. In the cold weather, Damien gets regular visits from local outreach workers Rick and Tash. Would you still be here without them? No. I'd be dead. I would have died of hypothermia. Or starvation. I worry about Damien. If I don't see him in a week, I'm out searching for him to make sure he's still alive and he's not dead. At this point, I've almost become institutionalised. So I'm almost used to being homeless. So I don't know nothing better. Is there a hope that things will change? or? Yeah, well, I know it will. Things will get better, because they can't get any worse. I know that. I'm an optimist. Anyone else that's out there and you're in the same situation as me, please don't do the same thing as I'm doing. Get yourself indoors, because there's no life. And there's no life you should have to be used to. It's a cruel but a very real fact that there are so many young LGBTQ people who are homeless because of their sexuality. And yet, when you spent your entire young life struggling with your sexuality or your gender identity and you're vulnerable because of it, the horrible irony is that that's the point in your life where you need a safe space or a place to call home the most. It's been a month since John Kahn moved into his temporary accommodation here in Livingston, Scotland. So I've come to see how he's getting on. Hi, Hi how are you? I'm good, thank you, come in. So this is, this is the pad? Yes, it is the pad. Can we have a little look around at your yes, stuff? Yes, of course you can. Where did you get these fellas from? 
Are they, uh, they're brothers, are they? Yeah. See no evil, hear no evil, and ah, speak no evil. Yes. Yes. I love your taste in movies as well. <laughs> Sal Asking Sandra Bullock, Beyonce. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jennifer Hudson. Yes. I love the pride flag. Oh, yeah. Why is it important to you to have them all over the house? I don't know, I just... Adds colour for the start, you see, the white walls. <laughs> um, and uh, to me, it just, as I said, signifies, you know, love and peace and equality and diversity. And, um, where, where did you get this one? Uh, it was in Edinburgh, um, my very first gay pride. Your first? And, yeah. Oh, my this, very is, first. this is precious. Yes, that sounds very precious. This is like gold dust. Wow. <laughs> How important is it for you to have all of these things, like your own style in the place? Oh yeah, it's like really important to me because um, I feel a bit more secure when I see my things around. How do you feel now that you're here? I love the flat, the flat's amazing, but I'm just not sure about the community yet, you know. Um, I don't know how the community is, but I am settling a bit. How important is having a home for your, your mental health or for you just to function as a human? Well, it is important to me because, like, my house is my sanctuary, you know, it's somewhere where I'm meant to be safe and secure and somewhere at, a, at an end of a long day I can just come in and shut the door and be myself and... Put your wig on if you want. Put my wig on, yeah, <laughs> yeah, or my makeup or prance about dancing to Gaga, you know. Um, next year it'll be my year. I keep saying that at the end of every year. This, no, next year's going to be my year. I'm going to make it my year.